Hey, good afternoon. My name is Dave Pasco. I'm the deputy chair of the Republican Party of Minnesota. Uh, we're doing a series of panels with all of our congressional candidates, our gubernatorial Senate candidates. There's a lot of people that we're going to be coming through. And uh, close to my heart, uh, the 5th and the 4th Congressional District, uh, and that's uh, the Minneapolis, CD5, and then St. Paul and the surrounding suburbs, CD4. The Republican endorsed and primary uh, winner is Jennifer Zielinski, uh, the candidate for CD5, and then for CD4 is Greg Ryan. Uh, this is your second time out running for, uh, so thanks for running twice, we really appreciate that. Uh, and we're very honored to have Andrew Lee from AM 1130, Twin Cities News Talk, uh, come out and moderate the panel. So please give our panel us a big round of applause and I'll turn it over to Andrew. Thank you so much. And thanks for everybody for coming out and spending some time with us. It's really appreciated. Uh, Jennifer, Greg, welcome. Uh, why don't we start off with, uh, with you, Jennifer. This is your uh, first time running for Congress. Greg, as you mentioned, your second time. Uh, just take a minute and just tell everybody a little bit about yourself, a uh, little bit about your background, and uh, why you decided to jump in this race. Thanks for having me. Nope. Turn it on. There, you there go. we go. There you go. Thanks for having me. And I'm running to really be a voice for the 5th Congressional District, and I believe this is the year and important for us to have that voice in Congress. It's been ignored for so long. We've had Keith Ellison representing us, so it's time to really take back and put in some common sense principles in Congress. Go ahead. <clears throat> My name's Greg Ryan. I'm running for the second time for U.S. Congress in the 4th Congressional District. I'm, I'm running against a 32-year politician. She's been in Congress for 18 years and she wants two more. So I felt compelled that I needed to take myself away from my small business and run for Congress because of the inequities that have been imposed on us for years and years and years by the Democrat Party. And so it's almost suffocating us citizens of the 4th District and we need to change that. Now you two have decided to step in to run in two of the bluest districts in this state. Um, specifically, Ellis's district is uh, really solidly blue. What, uh, we'll start with you, Greg. Since you ran uh, previously two years ago, what's different, if anything, this time around? Has the Trump presidency, two years of the Trump presidency, sort of altered the landscape in any fashion that you think you, uh, your chances are, are better this time around? Well, it used to be a predominantly Democrat stronghold, but now since we have this big divide, the Democrats and Republicans are divided more than ever before. So there are going to be a lot more people interested in voting for the right person, which is me, for the 4th District. So that's what I've seen in the landscape happening. We've gotten this division that has been going way, way up more and more. So what we're trying to do, can people hear me out there? Okay, sorry, we were having yeah. a problem. Why don't we take it out so you guys just pass it back and forth. <clears throat> so I just feel very comfortable running for the second time uh, for U.S. Congress. I did get over 34% of the vote last time, and I expect to get a lot more this time. Betty's been there for, 30, uh, for 18 years. I'm a 34-year business owner. She's a 32-year politician. You do the math. <laughs> Well, it's really what have the Democrats done for the 5th Congressional District, which right. I want to ask. Um, we've been represented by a Democrat since 1963 as in our Congressional District, and education is failing. Uh, we have a huge achievement gap in my district, and the economy is starting to improve, and I want to connect that to what President Trump is doing in Congress. So I just want to push those values forth that it is about the government letting businesses grow, which allows co companies to give their employees more take-home pay and better benefits. Why do you think, uh, if you could expand on, on why, do you, why do you think Democrats have had such a uh, stronghold, have had such a vice grip on power in, in these districts for so long, when, like you said, the results don't really bear out when you've had the same leadership, not just in Congress, but when you look at local leadership in those areas as well. They've been Democrat strongholds for decades, even generations, and the results have not been fantastic. The education system, as you mentioned, is kind of a mess. There's a huge achievement gap. Uh, government just hasn't functioned great in that area is under Democratic leadership. So why do you, why do you think the, the, the Republicans have had such a difficult time uh, sort of, you know, opening that door and saying, hey, give us a shot. Unfortunately, uh, I think the Democrats have sold some of the people in my district um, something that 
you know, depending on the government, we can make it better this time. They keep making promises they can't hold true on. And that's what I want to change when I get to Congress, is making that difference um, with our education, with our economy, keep it growing. Really, you know, give people in my district a chance to experience what the tra t Trump tax cuts really mean to them and uh, helping that grow. So it's, it's just they keep selling them the same bill of goods that yeah. unfortunately isn't true. Greg, what's so special about Betty McCollum that she manages to keep getting reelected over and over and over despite being, you know, I, I, I'd say one of the more less effective members of Congress? Well, we need to flush her out of Congress is my main point. It's tough to compete with free. She encourages the free stuff. She encourages the free education, the free food, the free uh, health care. So it's really challenging to compete with free. So that's what Jen and I are up against, is competing with the free uh, givers. So I think people are starting to be a little bit more aware of that. The education system in St. Paul, which is a feeder for all small businesses, so if you don't graduate from a high school, then the small business owners are not going to get good quality help. So the schools have been uh, pretty close to the Democratic Party. They've been supporting the Democrat Party, and they do feed them a lot of money. And that money comes from the citizens. So what we need to do is change that education system so a lot of these kids have a choice where they can go, where the parents want to choose them to go. But the schools in St. Paul are, have been failing miserably for a long time, and I think our economy is showing that in St. Paul. They have to keep raising the taxes everywhere in the liberal areas, so it's just kind of tough to compete with that. But I'm very, very encouraged of the words that I'm hearing out here and around this district that people are tired of it and they want change. you got K Street that is dictating a lot of policies. Those are the lobbyists that are right across the street from the Capitol, and they have close uh, connections with the Democrats. So they're being told what to vote for and what not to vote for, so we're going to try to end that. As you guys uh, go out and work your district and go to events and do the door knocking, are there any specific... Um, platforms, you know, of the GOP message, of the Republican message, of the conservative message that you see resonating with, with the people in the district? Any, any one or two specific issues that you feel act is actually effective and, and that you can get them to spend some time and listen to? First of all, I'm going to welcome my friend Krisha right there. <laughs> so I have to give her a shout out. A uh, co-worker of mine. Everyone look at her. <laughs> um, Economy and immigration are some of the huge issues facing my district. And right now immigration is really big in the news with some of the things that have happened recently. Sure. But we do have a lot of people who are undocumented in the fifth. And I want to try to bridge that gap and come to real solutions for immigration that will help people in my district, but also keep our country safe and protect our citizens in our country. Economy is really big, too. Um, we want to keep that economy growing. I know I've said it a couple times, yeah. but um, really give people a chance to succeed in my district and achieve the American dream as they want to. Well, it's true that when the economy is doing well, suddenly, you know, all the other issues don't seem quite as important. Yes. They don't seem like they're quite as big a deal, you know, when the economy is doing well. Results matter. Yes, and that's why I even tie it to education, is I want our kids to succeed for the future. I want our kids to be part of our economy and really win big and right greg what issues uh do you find are resonating uh on the from, through, from the gop side in you know a, a, one of the stronger blue districts well those strong blue districts i call it the urban rot but in the urban areas what we have is we have the encouragement of sanctuary cities all we need to say is molly tibbetts uh the gal that died down in iowa from at the hands of an illegal alien that's terrible. Now that's real. That's really happening in St. Paul, Minneapolis. We have two cities that encourage sanctuary cities, and we just can't do that. As far as the economy is running along very, very strong and smooth, and the Democrats are looking at it as seizing more of our money. So they know the economy is running well, so they have an opportunity to steal more of your money. We don't want that. We want to prevent that from happening. We'd rather have you have the money in your pockets because we know 
us consumers in the United States, we love spending money. And if we have less money to spend, we wouldn't be able to spend it. So the Demo don't let the Democrats get your money and spend it. My whole platform is keeping your money in your pocket, and we have to lower taxes by cutting, cutting government size. One of the reasons that you know Democrats tend to be uh, tend to be have have really strong results and, and tend to be more successful in these condensed areas like this is is union money. You know, you got a lot of public sector union employees, a lot of a uh, lot of organizations and a lot of organizing that goes on through the unions in these urban areas. Do you think maybe with the uh, with the recent Janus ruling? and with the push for more right-to-work legislation advancing in some states, not necessarily in Minnesota yet. Um, but do you think that that may help the GOP in, in upcoming election cycles to be a little more competitive in these urban areas? I believe it will be. And, I, you know, the GOP started up the Republican Farm Labor's um, area this year. So I think it's really reaching out to people who are in unions, typically vote Democrat, letting them know that the Democrats have failed them and that we are here to help them. We want them to grow and succeed in their companies and their worlds just as much as we want anybody to succeed. Greg, any thoughts on that? Well, since Janus, a lot of the unions have preemptively dealt with this before the Janus ruling. I think they all anticipated the Supreme Court's ruling. So what they did is they talked to the union membership and they decided that we're going to just have some sort of a, a bank uh, withdrawal, electronic withdrawal. So they did get a hold of it, a lot of the un rank and file union members to grab their money from their accounts and have it electronically deposited into the, uh, the coffers of the unions, which actually go directly to the unions. So that's going to be a challenge in itself. But once they get a taste of that extra 20 or $30 a month in their pocket, I don't know if they're going to be willing to give that up to a, a union that's extremely partisan. Talk a little bit about the Trump effect. We are two years into the Trump administration. Obviously, he's, uh, he, he, he's a president that sparks strong reactions. <laughs> From, from from all sides, um, what are you hearing? Is is the is the reaction to Trump in your district as you're walking around, as you're doing the door knocking, as you're meeting people? Is it as strong as watching the mainstream media and watching the cable news would have us believe? I know not everyone in my district likes Trump. There's still the resist movement that is pretty deep into Minneapolis. But one thing I always bring up is that twi uh, Twitter tweets, it's the first time that a president has really been able to reach out to the, reach out to the people directly. It's, we've never had this before in our country where our president can talk to us directly and not use the media as a medium. There's still the resist movement and it's still something that I do have to work through and it's something I have to bring up as the issues um, that Trump is improving on with education, with prison reform, with um, the economy. That, we are putting more money into the pockets of everyday working families so they have choices over their own money versus the government spending their money. Greg, what are you hearing when it comes specifically to President Trump? Is, is, is he a big factor when you're, uh, when you're out there talking to uh, the electorate? Trump is an enormous factor for me because it encourages me to tell people that I am a Trump fan. Um, <clears throat> we're actually watching live time of the struck and page insurance policy. Now we're seeing this insurance policy take place in full color on our media right now. They're accusing uh, Trump and some of his associates, so they're getting uh, deeper and deeper and the, uh, the media is jumping on board with that. So we're starting to watch this insurance policy of the text take place in real time. So we need to make sure we understand that. Let's look at the way the economy is going. Let's look at the way the regulatory uh, departments have been reducing the burden of, uh, like the coal and a lot of the other industries are being able to do what they did best, is provide and can, uh, be uh, big producers of product. So I think it's encouraging for me. It's sad that there is such a divide. I've never seen a divide like this like ever before. So it is encouraging for me, and I am proud to say I am a Trump supporter. Uh, but at every turn, the media and Hollywood is putting up roadblocks. So we need to stand strong and continue forward for our cause. 
We want the American people to be in control. And that's just what the Democrats don't want. They do not want us in control. We want to be in control. The, the American people should be in control. Running for Congress in urban districts, in, in districts like, like yours, the CD4 and CD5, is very challenging. It's also very different than running in, say, a suburban district or a district out in greater Minnesota. If uh, Are there any lessons, especially, Greg, since this is your second time around, are there any lessons that you think could be valuable to candidates? Uh, anything you've learned in running in these in these types of districts in, in such, a, such a democratic, strong district uh, that you think would be valuable to candidates running in suburbs or greater Minnesota? Any lessons the GOP can pick up and perhaps improve upon with what they're doing? Well, it's a continuing education for me. Every time I turn around, a new thing comes up. Uh, it, it encourages people to work harder. I think the divide makes people want to work harder. At least it does for me. I'm not really interested in the Trump uh, haters because they don't advance my, uh, my agenda. My agenda is leaving the public and us citizens in charge. That's not what's happening right now. So I try to discourage that uh, the hating part. I can't really deal with that. But it is, uh, it is an experience and I'm kind of trying to figure out that I don't need to spend a whole lot of time and effort on the people that hate uh, the Trump. So it's just a bad vibe for all of us. I mean, let's just keep our hateful thoughts to ourselves and then just say what we love. I think the GOP really has to continue to push its message out to people in my district. It's, you know, we call ourselves now the Growth and Opportunity Party, and that's really what we're about. We're about, you know, the average working American, average American can succeed in this country no matter what they do. And we want to help that when they work uh, for a company, they can take home more of their pay, they can make decisions if they run a company and not have government regulation beating down on them. If you were to, uh, if you were to win, you were to pull off, you know, uh, the, the win and, and get into Congress, uh, when you think about the Trump agenda, talk a little bit about a couple of the key issues of the Trump agenda so far that you strongly support, and if there are any, uh, any uh, items in the Trump agenda, in the administration's agenda, that you're not necessarily in favor of and that you might push back against. I'm in support of economy growing, less taxes, and less government regulation. I definitely want to keep a check on tariffs. Um, I believe they are working for our country, and what they are, what Trump did do is he did roll back uh, tariffs, which were basically put in place in the Cold War era. So it was taking control of what we earn as a com uh, country. But I want to keep pushing the economy and keep growing that. Uh, my father was a victim of murder, so every time I hear of things happening, Molly Tibbetts is at the top of my mind right now and what that family is going through. I experienced death by murder from my fa of my father in 1984. That was 34 years ago. So I, I, I can't, I can't uh, ex express myself enough for the, the Molly Tibbetts family and what they're going through right now. And that is a clear indication of we do need a border wall. We really have to have the border wall and legal immigration really needs to be uh, at the forefront of our talking right now. Uh, it's, it's taken so much away from us. A lot of people will say, well, they're good for the economy. Well, they're not, because what they're doing is they're driving costs, uh, wages down, and these people are taking jobs that would otherwise be used by uh, legal American citizens. In Congress, specifically in regards to issues facing your district, uh, what would be your top priority in terms of what you would want to focus on, what committees you would like to be a part of? I want to be on the Educational Workforce for, um, Committee. And the reason is something I keep hammering home is I want to work for the achievement gap and to bring that together in my district. So I want to keep working to better our education um, in my district. I'm going to say bye to my friends there. <laughs> it's, it's solely more of an economic thing for me. I've been working in a poor neighborhood my whole life. That's where my company is at, so a good chunk of the customers are uh, they don't have as much money as a lot of us. 
I think that our government has been taking more and more and more of their share of money. If we have ever gone into a federal building or a state building, we do observe a lot of excess of labor. And in a small business owner's mind and eyes, he sees waste. He sees that I wouldn't be able to survive in business for two weeks with this type of payroll. So a business, small business owner uh, really sees it up close and understands the, the economic part and the, and the economic dangers and the hurdles that we have to jump through every day. And that equates to a higher price to the consumer and then consumers get a little leery about paying more. Has the uh, you know with, with the with the news of this week with uh, with Paul Manafort with Michael Cohen and all that the we're starting to see a ramp up of impeachment talk when it comes to people running for Congress um, in your race so far with regards to your opponent has that been an issue so far has that been coming up not yet in my race uh, and one thing I say is that if I get to Congress and I see that Trump has done anything that is impeachable I'll be right there calling for it but I haven't seen that yet. You know, with Manafort, this was something, tax evasion from quite a few years ago. So he did get, you know, convicted of something he did commit. Right. He's going, he's, serving, he's going to serve his time. Um, with Cohen, this is something that ha unfortunately happens in every presidential campaign. You know, all we have right now is he paid money to somebody. Campaign finance violations. Campaign, fi yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that being said, I know That's if my... Like the worst case scenario of what we're looking at right now. There's no collusion to Russia right now from right. this. We're not even finding that. So, you know, one thing I will say is that we'll come up on my opponent's side. I believe they are out to impeach Trump, and that is one of their main objectives. And I'm going to work against that. You know, if, again, if our president does something that is illegal and constitutional, I'll be right up there. But I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> Greg, has it been an issue so far? Is it something that uh, you've you've picked up some chatter from your opponent's campaign? Uh, it, it hasn't been that much. Uh, the the Manafort Cohen situation, I think, is the the page struck insurance policy taking place. We can grab anybody and uh, we can dig into their history, and we might find somebody that jaywalked uh, a while back or ten years ago. So um, everybody has the closet, and there's different items in the closet. So I just think that it's a lot to do about two, two bad decision makers. Manafort and Cohn made bad decisions. That's all there is to it. But I think our media and Hollywood is starting to drag uh, President Trump into this thing. And it is that insurance policy of uh, Page and Strzok or Strzok and Page that is playing out in real time uh, with us. That's the way I see it. In order to be more competitive in districts such as yours, what needs to change first? Is it something that the GOP can make some changes that would make it more effective, or is it simply a matter of, you know, demographics and union power and, and, and all of the all of the factors that come into play that make the Democrats so successful in those districts? Are we do we just kind of wait for that dam to break, or is there something the GOP can do? Uh, proactively to be more effective and be more successful? I'm actually not sure. I think it's going to be a little bit of both. Um, the GOP does have to maintain a strong presence in my district uh, just because to show that, hey, we are about everyone is succeeding in our country. We don't want anybody to not be part of the American dream. That being said, we do have um, a lot of people with a stronghold and there's an over-reliance on government, that it's that thought process in my district, and that's something that we got to overcome, that it's not about what the government can do for you, it's about what you can do for yourself and how you can really succeed. What, what's the question again? Well, uh, in, in order for the GOP to be more successful in, in these Democratic stronghold districts, these, these densely urban, urban areas, what do you think needs to change first? Is there something the GOP can do it can change, can it change its approach or messaging to be more effective, or do we simply wait for the dam to break of the, the demographics and the union power and the union money that make Democrats so successful? Well, that's a lot of it. I think that we need to look at the fundamental granular level with the city councils, the city mayors. If we look at the composition of the city councils and the city mayors within this ring, the metro ring, we've got 50 or 60 cities that are predominantly liberal and that's 
what's setting the stage for the rest of uh, the metro area. So I think if I encourage people of the conservative uh, flavor to run for their city council, to run for their mayors in the smaller cities and even in St. Paul and Minneapolis, we're just seeing a very, very progressive attitude in these uh, cities, these small cities, and I just keep looking at Maduro and Venezuela as to what socialists really looks like. So when you hit a million dollar or a million percent inflation, that's tough. And I know because I run a business in St. Paul, I've ran a business, a 67 year family company, I've ran it for 34 years, more than half of uh, its existence just this year. More than half of my company's existence, I've been the owner of, and my brother. Um, and I have been watching the degradation of the, the consumers, the degradation of the education system, and it just keeps going downhill. These, the education system is good feeders for the local businesses that are small businesses, medium businesses, one or two uh, mom and pop shops. Uh, and we're not getting as quality of people that are graduating or not graduating from the uh, high schools. Our graduation levels for minorities in the inner core cities have been uh, going down consistently with the, the Democrat uh, stronghold. So I see it on the education level and the, uh, the consuming of free goods that the Democrats love to give out. Free housing, free food, free education, free health care. That's their theme, and that's what they're working on, and who doesn't like free? So it is a challenge, and we just need to make sure the consuming public understands that if you've got a really a good job and you just got a raise, well, guess what? Your government just got a raise, too. So people don't understand that, and I wish they would. We're consumers. We love spending money, too, but we like making money. But when our government has their hand out at every turn, it discourages the free flow of ambitious people to earn more money and work harder. It takes away that incentive to work harder because if I know somebody else is gonna be stealing my money, why would I wanna work harder? It's just the Maduro effect and that million percent inflation. That's crazy. So that's kind of, we're stronger than that, but we have more money than that so we can last longer. And it's sad. It's really sad. So we need to educate the public better. This is uh, the uh, CD4, CD5 panel, Greg Ryan, Jennifer Zielinski. Uh, if anybody in the audience has any questions for our panelists, feel free to step up and raise your hand, and, uh, and we'll, we'll take some audience questions as we sort of wind things down here. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the Met Council. Uh, the Met Council is something that I think, you know, if you're on the right side of the aisle, if you're on the more conservative side, certainly uh, I think you'd find some consensus that the Met Council needs to be reined in. Uh, it's it's grown beyond its original intent, and it, it mm -hmm. wields way too much power. And it's beginning to it's beginning to have a much more of a political influence in the metro area, in the outer suburbs as well, uh, than than it was intended or designed to have. As a member of Congress, is that something that you feel like you can help rein in? Is that would that be a priority of yours? Oh, um, my priority is to the people of the fifth. So I would definitely make any Minnesota issues my priority. Um, it was originally for about sewers and, you know, maintaining the sewer system. Connecting between infrastructure. Exactly. Yeah. And the bus system has really helped connect our cities. But when you start putting in light rail, you know, forcing it into neighborhoods and tearing up neighborhoods just to put it in, it destroys that. It also, you can't move a light rail. You can move a bus line from one street to another. But once you put a light rail, you know, tr track in, doesn't yeah. move. I would definitely push back on light rail. I love the bus system, and I would continue to help with that growing, but I would push back against the light rail in Congress. Met Council. Okay, you ready? <laughs> Me being a plumber and being in the plumbing business for you know, 34 years, I do understand what Met Council is like. Their original mandate was for the sewer and water distribution around the metro area along with the, uh, the airports. They've grown so big and so wide, they've become almost an autonomous agency that is not elected. Their uh, board of directors are appointed by the governor, and it's just terrible. We can't have that anymore. They've gone way past their mandate. When my uh, grandfather opened up his plumbing company on University Avenue in 1951, two years later, they took the they call it the trolley cars. The trolley cars or the light rail was removed from University Avenue. 
2012 it was reinstalled. We reintroduced 18th century uh, train technology back to our city right at the cusp of having autonomous cars. They've gone way, way beyond their mandate and they are consuming a good chunk of our money. Federal, the federal monies that pour into the Met Council is more than ever before. Nobody ever talks about that. Me being in the plumbing and heating business, they had excess money left over from light rail, so what they were doing is giving it to consumers to have their sewers repaired and uh, patched. So you probably have paid for your neighbor's sewer repair, which we do, um, and it's always a guaranteed money for any business, so I don't want to discourage people from hiring us from fixing that, but I always thought there was something wrong about having your neighbor pay for your repairs. So let's just get back to the fundamentals if you've, you know, the Met Council has gone way beyond their scope and we need to rein that in a lot. So they've gotten to the point where they're not accountable for what they do. They just spend our money. Jennifer, since uh, this is, is your first time running for a Congress, you mentioned you ran for a park board uh, last time around. Uh, What's it been like so far? I mean, what have you, uh, any surprises that, uh, that, that, that you weren't expecting? Uh, talk a little bit about the experience so far. Well, I get to be at the state fair and I get a microphone, so I must be kind of important. Hey, that's <laughs> always fun. Exactly. Um, it's been kind of a whirlwind since April. You okay? <laughs> um, yeah, you're a little cold. <laughs> it's my, I call it my second full-time job that I don't get paid for, I raise money for, but it all goes into my campaign, which is the huge thing. I get to meet a lot of people and I get to be on the TV now, so that's been very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really about getting out there and meeting everybody in my district as much as possible. Yeah. Um, it's probably a little bit easier in my district than other districts because we, we are the smallest congressional district. Um, yet in the, the most eight. populated. So. Most populated. Yeah. So. It's crazy. Yes. So that's um, why it's a bigger one. But yeah. yeah, it's about getting out there and meeting everybody. Greg, since uh, this is your second time, is it, uh, is it easier? Is it the same? Is it different at all? What, what, what did you learn from your first time around that you're applying uh, to this race? I learned a lot. Infrastructure is a little uh, established for me. I don't have to go out and invent things. Um, I've got great support staff. I got uh, just great volunteers, and you you get the you get those relationships in time. You earn those relationships. You just don't say, "Hey, I need this" or "I need that." You can't do that. You need to establish relationships and prove to people that you. Uh, you're a viable candidate and you're trustworthy and honest with the public. So it, it is a little easier for me. I know it's a challenging district, but I just feel passionate about it and compelled that I need to uh, be the voice for the people that don't ha have that opportunity. Um, and right now with these cycles, we have this media cycle going on and the Republicans are up against a lot, but it's not insurmountable. We're dealing with a Democrat party that is uh, one person in particular is accused of uh, domestic abuse. That's what we're running up against. So I think it's a clear, uh, clear idea for what we need to do and what we can do. So when we have the socialist um, party that's running against the GOP, when we have this, uh, the individual that has been accused of domestic abuse, I'm trying to find out if Betty McCollum would like to make a statement about what her thoughts are on domestic abuse. My thought is that she should actually ask uh, Keith Ellison to resign until things are sorted out. She hasn't done that. She's been silent. And I think the silence is deafening uh, to a lot of uh, her constituents and you know my constituents too. So I think that there's a clear picture of uh, right and wrong, and the GOP is the one that uh, we need to decide on. I'm glad you brought up uh, Keith Ellison. Uh, I'd like to, uh, specifically for, for Jennifer, uh, running in his district, mm -hmm. has the, have the allegations against Keith Ellison been a, a talking point in your district? Have the constituents expressed any concern over these allegations, or does it seem like, as, which, as with many of the DFL candidates so far that have endorsed him, 
does it seem like they're kind of just shrugging their shoulders and brushing it off? It, they're ignoring it right now, I think. They're trying to let it go through or pretend it doesn't exist. And, you know, not only has he been endorsed by quite a few of them, but he's endorsed quite a few of them. And I think they're leaning on that endorsement to get them through their campaign here. Um, you know, he does have a right to you know, um, face his accusers. And if he's innocent, I hope um, this comes to light. But I really hope that we do encourage these accusers to you know, keep coming forward with information so we can find out the truth of what's happening with this. Well, and, and based yeah. on the... Based on the bar that has been set yeah. with other politicians that have faced far less troubling accusations, to be honest, I mean, far less egregious accusations, uh, it does seem like Keith Ellison is being held to a different standard than, say, an Al Franken was, or uh, a Tony Cornish, or a Dan Schoen were. And I don't disagree with that. Um, you know, whether or not he resigns, I hope he finds the right way to do it, just because he even advised Al Franken to resign if that was the right, better thing to do. Right. So. You, Greg, you mentioned uh, the media cycle. And uh, one thing that is a challenge for uh, Republican candidates in this area is, is the media. Uh, you don't necessarily have a friendly media towards Republicans. How difficult has it been to basically get attention uh, from some of the mainstream media outlets in, the, uh, in your district? Well, the mainstream media has been losing market share for years and years and years, and the reason is is not only because of the Internet, but because of the messages that they've been uh, throwing out there. I think that uh, us consuming public have become more aware of the partisan media, the partisan Hollywood, so people are pretty bright to identify that, so I think that's uh, in direct relation to their market share. If we actually looked at the market share which the media commands has been diminishing over the last 10 years, and it's just getting worse and worse. If we look at some of the polls, the media has become more untrustworthy, so I think we're just watching this, um, this organic trend just take place in front of our eyes, and I think the more of the honest people um, are being heard more and being attracted to more. So I just think that it's a competitive thing. A lot of these media outlets are just finding it uh, more difficult to convince the consuming public that they are credible and they are uh, worthy of listening to and being advised of. Again, uh, put the call out if there are any audience questions for, uh, for Jennifer or Greg, your CD4 and CD5 candidates, feel free to come on up. I'm... Uh, I'm about out of uh, topics. Any last uh, pitches you want to make before we, uh, before we wrap this up? Uh, no, but thanks for having me. and glad to be here and glad to get something to say in the state fair. And this will be an exciting campaign in election season. I know that for sure. Give out your website where people can contact you, learn about you, and most importantly, donate. <laughs> donate. I'm at Jen, oh, Jen for us. It's jen4us.com if you want to visit my website. Um, my website is Ryan for us, R Y A N number four us, uh, like brother sister here. Uh, the donate button works well. It actually works a little slower at the dollar level, and then it gradually works harder and faster as the donors uh, put a little bit more in there. But I encourage everybody to get involved in this political thing because it does directly affect all of us. So I encourage a lot of these people in the crowd and at the state fair to volunteer, to go door knock, to lit drop, and to put signs up. And just, we need to do this together because we are all in this together because we all would rather have more money in our own pockets. But ryanforus.com, jenforus.com. Thank you guys very much. It's a pleasure uh, moderating this with you. And uh, you. good <laughs> continued success and good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you.